Leider hatte der Herr Rockström ja keine Zeit, um zum Automodernen Sportkongress nach München zu kommen. Ist sein Zug ausgefallen, weil er wäre bestimmt nicht mit dem Privatjet gekommen, unterstelle ich einfach mal. Nee, er heißt nicht Friedrich Merz, aber er fährt auch Auto, sagte. Ähm, und das Thema ist, dass er uns dann aber in dieses wunderbare, alte, ehrwürdige Potsdam-Institut für Klimafolgenforschung äh, eingeladen hat. Du warst da. Ich war da und es ist wirklich schön da oben. Ich sollte Klimaforscher werden. Ähm, du bist ja ein Stück weit Klimaforscher. Ja, Forschung. Aber ähm, wir reden viel drüber, wir schreiben viel drüber. Und, und, und du machst doch auch reproduzierbare Inhalte. Mit stetiger Regelmäßigkeit Podcasts zum Beispiel. Zum Beispiel. Ja. Okay. Worauf äh, Herr, Herr Rockström, ähm, John Rockström, rauf hinaus wollte, war, wie denn diese ganze Geschichte mit dem Klimawandel eigentlich funktioniert und warum wir da was machen sollten, weil er hat mit seinem Konzept, das er mitentwickelt oder federführend eigentlich entwickelt hat, mit diesen planetaren Grenzen, wie das funktioniert mhm. und welchen Anteil an dieser Grenzüberschreitung von diesen Grenzen die Autoindustrie hat letztendlich relativ plausibel und eindrücklich beschrieben, was ich echt spannend fand, weil das gut auf den Punkt bringt. Was ich, ich glaube, nicht so geschafft im, im, im Programm firmiert es unter kritischer Zwischenruf. Ich denke, so kann man es einordnen. Ja, also er nimmt die Autohersteller schon so ein bisschen ähm, an die Kandare und liest ihnen die Leviten. Kandare und Leviten, das ist schön. schön. Du solltest wirklich in so einem alten Forschungsinstitut arbeiten, ich merke Unbedingt. das schon. Aus eine noch wildere Frisur und irgendwie eine seltsame Vorliebe für Aufnäher auf dem Ellbogen. Ja. Oder so ein tweet -Sacko. Ich sehe das sehr deutlich vor mir. Ähm, ich weiß gar nicht mehr, was Professor Rockström trägt in seinem Video. Ich bin. Ich glaube, ein bisschen sowas. Ein bisschen tweet -Sacko. Ich glaube nicht Tweet, aber ich glaube so Aufnäher. Wir gucken nach. Wir gucken nach. Ihr auch. Viel Spaß. So dear um, participants at this uh, automotive um, conference, uh, this is a, a really important and timely event. Science shows clearly that we're facing rising global risks if we do not transform very rapidly towards a fully decarbonized world economy, where the transport sector, of course, plays a fundamental role in many economies representing up to 30% of global emissions. So let me just give you a scientific rundown of where we are today and why we can say that the only currency that matters today in industry, in the economy, in the world is speed and scale. So the number one is that um, not only have we reached 1.2 degrees Celsius of global mean surface temperature rise, if you look at the 10-year average changes, 2023 we touched 1.5 and we know the implications. It was the most expensive years in terms of people and economy impact. Over 300 billion US dollars in extreme events from floods, droughts, heat waves, reinforced storms, fires across the entire planet. As we speak, we have 49 degrees Celsius of life-threatening heat in New Delhi. We had the Rio Grande del Sol, 800 millimeters of flash floods in a whole state in southeast Brazil. It continues. And you may have seen the scariest data point of them all, which is the ocean. The surface temperature of the ocean have for the past 40 years gradually increased because 90, 90% of the heat caused by our fossil fuel burning from oil, coal and gas is not in the atmosphere, it's in the ocean. The planet is this massive buffering system, a thermostat that is, that is uh, basically hiding and dampening the impacts of the energy imbalance caused by our internal combustion engine and fossil fuel driven world economy. Now in 2023, suddenly the surface temperatures of the ocean goes completely off the charts. And we cannot even explain it. Several standard deviations outside of the rapidly rising temperatures in the ocean. Then comes 2024 and it just continues even further off the chart. What is happening? The honest answer scientifically is we do not know. It cannot be reproduced in any climate models and we do not have any explanation so far. Is it a sign of a planet which is losing resilience? It cannot be excluded. These are early warning signs of things happening faster than we had predicted. Did you know that 
The surface temperature on Earth, having reached the 1.2 degrees Celsius of mean surface temperature rise, increased with roughly 0.18 degrees per decade between 1970 and 2008. I mean, that was already a massively rapid increase in warming, 0.18 per decade. From 2010 onwards, suddenly that flips to the double. So we're now following a path where the temperature rise increases by 0.3 degrees Celsius per decade. You know, almost one degree per generation. Now, why is this happening? We don't fully understand. Is it, again, that the Earth's system is losing some of its buffering capacity? It cannot be excluded. And let me just run down that buffering capacity one more time with you. The ocean, 90% of heat is absorbed in the ocean. Carbon dioxide, 50% of the carbon dioxide from our, again, exhaustive um, combustion of fossil fuels across the world economy, 50% of that carbon dioxide, 25, half of it is in the ocean, and the other half is taken up on intact nature on land. So overall, the message is as, as follows. We are taking big risks, we've underestimated the pace of change, we're running out of time, and we're losing, it appears, the buffering capacity of the planet. So that is kind of the risk assessment. What does this translate to in terms of why the automotive industry across the world needs to, I would argue, step up the pace of phasing out uh, diesel and gasoline driven internal combustion engines. Well, it's because the carbon budget that remains for us to be able to hold the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit that all countries have agreed upon in the legally binding Paris Agreement is, is shrinking very fast. 2021, when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its sixth report, it concluded that we had roughly 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide remaining for an orderly phase-out of coal, oil, and gas. Today, only 200 remains. 200. And we're emitting 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year. 200 divided by 40 gives us another five years of emissions at the current level. And unfortunately, we're not bending the curve. So even though we have double-digit positive exponential rise in renewable energy systems from solar voltaics and wind, biomass-based uh, uh, energy systems, it is still not bending the curve on oil, coal, and gas. And that is where the whole transport sector comes in, because you are part of the solution here. You are the bloodstream in the modern economy. There is no uh, modern economy without transport, be it personal transport, heavy truck, air, shipping, all transport systems is what makes the world the world as we know it. And therefore, transitioning away from fossil fuels is one of the most important um, signals for all industries to be able to uh, truly become net zero across scope one, two, and three, because the supply chains require all forms of automotive transport systems. We know that we're also in a situation of a double race against time. And let me give you the race in terms of the automotive industry to close with, but also first the Earth system race. We conclude today that the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit is actually still possible to hold. This is debated. Not all scientists agree here. But my conclusion is that we can still hold 1.5. We need to do it because go beyond 1.5 and we risk triggering a number of tipping points that could lead to irreversible changes, like, for example, losing the Greenland ice sheet, tipping over the whole uh, West Antarctic ice sheet, losing all tropical coral reef systems. So we don't want to go beyond 1.5. The, the challenge, though, why we need to speed up the transition is that um, science today shows quite clearly that the only way to hold 1.5 is to accept a period of overshoot, meaning that we cannot just go directly to 1.5. We will very likely breach 1.5 somewhere in the next 10 years, between 2030 and 2035. That is really serious because we'll have 30, 40 years of overshoot between 0.1 and 0.3 degrees Celsius of overshoot before having a chance to landing back at 1.5 by the end of this century. What does this imply? Well, for one thing, with zero uncertainty, 
is that it, uh, the message is very simple, buckle up because we're entering a very jumpy period with rising extreme events. That is a certainty, more droughts, floods, heat waves hitting across the global economy. The more uncertain part is do the tipping point systems cope with this overshoot period? And the honest answer, we do not know. Can the ocean, the Amazon, the Borofors, the permafrost, the green ice sheet, the AMOC, can these systems hold on even during a period of overshoot? That is something we're scientifically working on today. But the most important message is the following. Why would the planet come back? So we turn off the oil, coal and gas supply of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We do everything right. And still the Earth system then comes back to 1.5. Well, the answer scientifically is very clear. The reason, the only reason the planet would come back is if we come back into the safe operating space of planetary boundaries. What does this mean? Well, it means stopping deforestation, um, not overusing freshwater, not losing biodiversity, not changing land systems from intact nature, not overloading the biosphere with reactive nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilizers. The, the, the nature part of the planet must remain healthy because a healthy planet, meaning a healthy biosphere, meaning healthy ecosystems on land and a healthy ocean, means that they can continue buffer carbon dioxide, keep carbon sinks intact, avoid methane fluxes, and keep heat intact. That is the necessary steps to make us come back after overshoot. So it's not surprising, is it, that we scientists today say, well, even if you care only about climate, you need to have a planetary boundary framework because the planetary boundaries define the nine Earth system processes that regulate the stability of the whole Earth system. And we can quantify these boundaries and unfortunately, the assessment, the latest assessment is that six of these nine are outside of the safe space. Biodiversity, freshwater use, overloading of nitrogen phosphorus, land system change, um, chemical pollution, and climate. What relevance does this have for my second and final part then on the transition in the automotive industry? Well, it has very strong implications because when you are transitioning and innovating away from fossil fuels, the question is what are the different fuel sets that can take us away from oil, oil and, uh, and gas. Well, you have biofuels that impacts on other planetary boundaries like biodiversity, land and freshwater. Uh, we need to align the transition to green energy system, the green electricity provision, for example, for mobility within safe planetary boundaries. I'm quite excited here. Um, have you know, the privilege of interacting with, with many leaders in both the heavy truck industry uh, to the car industry around the world. And uh, I would argue that uh, the race is on. We're into a, uh, an innovation pathway moving towards a future uh, that is not entirely clear. But one thing we know is that we are at the beginning of the end of the internal combustion engine driven mobility era of humanity's existence on Earth. If it is fuel cells or BEVs or different kind of uh, methane-driven or biofuel-driven systems, uh, how do we change mobility cultures towards less private mobility to more public transport? All these questions are really up in the air here, but it's uh, you are in the driving seat here to, to lead the way and to be part of a pathway which is not about sacrifice. It's not about uh, losing out on, on, on a future compared to history. It's completely the reverse. It's actually moving towards a more attractive, more modern, more high-tech, and much, much healthier and um, an exciting future, which of course will determine the jobs and the economy and the competitiveness in the future. And we see this happening right as we speak. The double-digit exponential rise of electric BEV cars uh, flooded from countries like China is, um, is just showing that we are today in, in this big transition phase. I would even argue that those industries that try to uh, uh, put a pause button, for example, on the European Union's decision to, to stop the sales of uh, internal combustion engine cars from 2035, they are taking huge risks for the economy and competitiveness and the jobs in their own countries. Because if you want to go backwards into the future 
and want to stay with diesel and gasoline driven cars, you will by the end very likely be outcompeted by the more advanced technology that comes from competing countries that are moving so fast uh, on, on this journey. So I think now is the time to really embrace innovation and see sustainability as a way of accelerating a pathway towards a more technologically advanced future. And that's the point we are in for the whole automotive sector. So, you know, good luck with your summit. Uh, science is really, I would argue, giving you for sure a dire risk analysis, but also providing even more incentives for speed and scale, the only currency that counts. Thank you very much. Luca, sitzt du bequem? Schon, ja. Du sitzt aber falsch. Ja, ich weiß eigentlich, ähm, aber du sitzt auf meinem Platz. Stimmt. Hier jedenfalls sitzen eigentlich unsere Gäste. Unsere Gäste bei was? Beim Move New Mobility Podcast. Aber das ist nicht nur ein Podcast, sondern das ist eine ganze Themenwelt. Genau, wir machen ja ein Move Magazin und da beschreiben wir alles, was sich mit neuer Mobilität befasst. Von Innovation in Richtung KI bis zur Elektromobilität. Und das gibt es als Podcast, als Videos, als Talkformat und eben auch als Heft. Und als Event, nicht vergessen. Kongress gibt es auch noch, das ist auch mehr oder weniger Move-Territorium, denn es geht um die Mobilität von morgen und wir sprechen mit Entscheidern aus Industrie, aus Politik, aus Forschung, aus Entwicklung. Da sind große Namen dabei, die ihr so, glaube ich, in diesem nahbaren Miteinander nirgendwo sonst erleben könnt. Genau, und das machen wir für euch und wir freuen uns, wenn ihr auch dabei seid. Und ihr findet uns quasi überall, auf YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, auf der Website natürlich und eben bei unseren Veranstaltungen. Ja, ihr kommt quasi gar nicht um uns rum, eigentlich, genau. wenn wir ehrlich sind. Ne? Deswegen abonniert ihr jetzt mal fleißig da auf allen Kanälen und dann sehen wir uns halt auch auf den richtigen Plätzen. Genau, also auf rüber. Ja, ich, ja.